I'd like you to open your Bibles at 2 Corinthians and chapter 1. And we're going to begin a new series of sermons, messages from uh, God's Word, the Bible, and they're coming from 2 Corinthians. Try and work our way through this, uh, this letter and we'll see how far we can go in, in the months ahead. Today we want to look at what God says in the first seven verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And so for this to make sense to you, I'd like you to have your Bibles open, be able to see uh, the passage that we're talking about as we go along and uh, to understand it. Now just a, a very quick little bit about the backstory to this letter. Uh, so perhaps most of us know that this is the second letter in the New Testament that is addressed to the Corinthians, Corinthian Christians, Christians who live in Corinth, in Greece. And uh, there are Christians in Corinth because Paul, who is writing this letter, was used of God to go there and preach the gospel and establish a church. The trouble was it didn't turn out to be a church that was very harmonious. It was a church beset with a lot of difficulties and a lot of troubles. And if you want to know about those difficulties and troubles, well, you read 1 Corinthians, the first letter to the Corinthians. Well, here he is now, later on, and he's writing again. And he's writing to them a second time, and trusting and knowing, to some degree, that what he wrote in the first letter has had some good effect. It hasn't completely sorted out all the problems that were in the church, but it has had some good effect. And so he's now writing again to these Corinthians. There are still some people in the church in Corinth who are not happy with Paul. You know, churches are very often the scene of power struggles. Very often troubles in churches have something to do with power and influence and people wanting power and influence. That's exactly what's happened at Corinth. There are some people there who want to be more influential and more popular and uh, and want to be more in charge than Paul the Apostle. And so they are beginning to uh, criticise him and uh, question his authority and his ability. And uh, he's writing to them to tell them that they shouldn't do that and to tell them why he really is an apostle. So I encourage you to just do a bit of study. If you're completely unfamiliar with the Corinthian situation, then uh, look into it. Read 1 Corinthians, read 2 Corinthians over the next few months while we're having these messages. Now, coming back to what God will say to us here today from this part of the Bible. The first thing that you notice is that Paul always gives a greeting when he writes a letter. And you might be tempted to pass over those first few verses. But please don't do that because those first few verses are very important. And they're important here in this particular letter in the context of what he's going to say. So we've really got two different uh, sections, if you like. You've got verses 1 to 3, and then you've got verses 3 to 7. Verses 1 to 3 give you three really important insights. Insights into Paul and insights into us, uh, and especially into the church. Listen to what he says. He's writing to them, uh, and he says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timothy our brother to the church of God which is at Corinth with all the saints who are in all Achaia or Asia grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ now knowing that there are people back there in Corinth who are questioning his authority the first thing he wants to tell them is that he has been he has been made a leader of the church by God Only God makes leaders of churches. Now, in the situation and culture in which you live, you're well aware that authority is not popular. 
Authority is not popular anywhere. It's not respected as it once was. And sometimes uh, it's important for pastors and elders to assert their God-given authority. Even me saying that sounds and strikes you as something which might be suspect. We don't want a pastor asserting his authority. We don't believe in authority. Well, we do believe in authority. We don't believe in anyone's own personal authority, but we believe in the authority of God and the authority of Christ and the authority of the Bible. And we believe that God in his wisdom has given us gifts in the form of people. So many of God's gifts come to you in the form of a person wrapped up in a real living person who is a Christian whom God has called to do something for him so that you can be blessed and you can be encouraged. And an apostle, we don't have apostles today, but an apostle was someone like that. And Paul wants to remind them that he is an apostle, not because he's decided he wants to be an apostle, and not because he's taken it upon himself, but because he has been made one by God. An apostle is one who was sent by God. An apostle was someone who was an eyewitness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He was, although he says it was out of time, it was later, and he thinks he's least of all of them, nonetheless he witnessed the resurrection. He met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. So he reminds them of this, and he says, now the way it works is like this. You are the church in Corinth, I'm an apostle, you're obligated by God and his word to recognise that and to respect me and to take seriously what I'm saying. Because frankly, he says, I've only got your best interests at heart. So this, this is what he says as he opens the letter. And he says, now, remember, it's not just me. I've got Timothy, my brother, and your brother, our brother. He's right here with me. Now he's appealing to these people and these people know Paul and they know Timothy. And at some point in the history up to this point they themselves have recognised that God's hand is on both these men. They themselves have had a part in these men being set aside, being recognised, being ordained or whatever you want to call it. They themselves have had a part in that. So he's just reminding them, he's underlining this in their conscience so that they begin to see what he wants to say is of, is of importance to them and it comes with the authority of God. Very important. The next thing he tells them is a little insight about the church. So he says, I'm writing to you and this is how I see you. I don't know how you see yourselves, I don't know how the people might see you, but this is how I see you, and this is the right way to see you. You are the church of God, which is at Corinth. The church of God, which is at Corinth. Now, the ecclesia, the people who have been literally called out and called together. That's what the word ecclesia means. So at some point, and he's obviously talking about God calling, at some point in your lives, God called you out of darkness, out of your old life, out of your life which didn't have Jesus Christ in it at all. He called you out of that life and he called you into a new life and he didn't call you to live that life on your own. He didn't call you to isolation. He didn't call you to independence. He called you out and he called you together and you are the church of God. Now, if you wanted to, you could find all sorts of reasons why you shouldn't be calling the Corinthians the church of God. Because their behaviour has been abominable at times. It really has. Read 1 Corinthians. The sort of things that have gone on in that church are the sort of things that even in this liberal-minded cultural setting would scandalise most of us. But nonetheless, he calls them the church of God. The church of God. And then he says this, with all the saints who are in Asia, 
with all the saints. So he says, now listen, you owe your existence as a church to God. Not only do you owe your existence as a church to God, you're the church of God, but you are owned by God. Nobody else has ownership of your church, of this church. This church isn't owned by men, it isn't owned, and he's making sure they don't think he thinks he owns it, even though he says he's an apostle, rightly so. The church isn't owned by any man, or any men, or any denomination, or any people, or any factions that might want to own it. No, the church is owned by God. It is the church of God, he says. And to your human sense, and to my human sense, the church always appears to be a mixed multitude, if you like. And if you want to do, we want to put each other under the magnifying glass and uh, on any given day, in any given congregation, we could probably find all sorts of reasons why we should question whether we really are deserving of the name church or whether we're really measuring up to that description as saints, holy ones. Now, it doesn't mean saints like St. Margaret or St. Teresa or St. Barnabas. It doesn't mean that. It's a translation of a word that means holy ones. But with the understanding that that word holy to them doesn't mean sanctimonious. It doesn't mean that it's laden with ceremonies and all that sort of thing. It simply means that you're different. You have been set apart, literally. You have been made distinct from everyone else by virtue of the fact that you have become a Christian and Christ has taken up residence in your life and a new life has started. And the moment that happened, then in a sense all those old bridges were burned and you started a new life and you're different and you're distinct and you belong from then on to God in this special way. And so he does expect that churches will be made up of converted people. Of course he does. He's not saying, well, it's all right uh, simply to behave like you do in Corinth and for me to call you the church. Now, he doesn't think like that at all. That's obvious because of the first letter he's written. He's written trying to point out to them that their behavior isn't consistent with calling themselves Christians or saying that they go to church or they belong to the church. But nonetheless, you see, he says it. Now, people who make up the church, not, people, not just people who go to church, there's a big difference. Lots of people go to church, but not all those people make up the church. The church is made up in God's mind and God's word of people who have been converted, who have been born again, who have repented of their sin and turned to the Lord Jesus and put their trust in him who have become Christians. We don't stereotype that. We don't say, well, you must have become a Christian this way, otherwise you're probably not a Christian. No, not at all. But there must have been this radical work of God's grace in your life so that you passed from death, spiritual death, into spiritual life. And for every one of us, that will look different. And the story of it will be different. Of course it will. And some people might be able to say, well, I can remember the very day. I can remember the very hour. I can almost remember the, 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 the exact time on the clock when I became a Christian. Other people will say, no, I can't. I can't, I can't place a particular time, but I know without a shadow of a doubt, once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was dead in my sin, and now I have been made alive together with Christ. So he's writing to them and he calls them the church of God. Now this immediately should encourage you if you are a Christian and it should challenge you. It should challenge you, it should challenge every Christian because it seems to me that church, the priority of church in a Christian's life these days has really dropped dramatically. And uh, 
more and more the whole flow and tide of the culture is against us being committed to each other as a local body of believers in Christ. So he's got a lot more to say about that and he will a little later on. So he tells them who he is, he tells them why he's writing and he tells them he's got every right to write. And then he says, now you're the church. Not my church, you're God's church. And he says, the first thing I'm going to do for you is what any decent, thoughtful, qualified Christian leader should do for you, and that is to pray for you. What can I wish you? What can I wish for my church in the terms of my church, in terms of my attachment to it? What can I wish for these people who I've grown to love, who are part of my local fellowship? What can I think of, what can I wish for this uh, body, this family, this spiritual family to which I belong, into which God has led me, which has blessed me in so many ways? And so he says, he says to them, listen, this is what I wish, this is what I pray, because this is a prayer, really. He says, grace to you. Grace to you. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that beautiful? Well, what more could you possibly want than that? And this is how he starts. And, and he says, and he's talking obviously about God's grace. He's not talking about human grace. He's not talking about the kind of grace that's common to the whole world. He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. He obviously, in the context, is talking about grace, the grace that they've experienced, which is God's saving grace and the grace which he continues to give us every day after we have been saved. Grace. Grace to you. Remember the Sunday school lesson, yes? From, from Sunday school. Grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. That's grace. God's riches to you at Christ's expense. And so this is what he wishes to them. And then he says, grace to you and peace. Peace. Peace, not just any peace, but peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that he's already setting the pattern. This isn't new to him. Prayer is a prime a a primary part of his life. Prayer is a priority to him. He prays. He goes so far sometimes when he's talking about churches to say that he prays all the time for them. Can't imagine how he does that except that he just does it as he goes about his life. Prayer is so much a part of his life that he prays. A bit like my mother-in-law, Sue's mum, who was the wife of a dairy farmer and the mother of six children, very committed in a local church, busy on the farm, but prayed. And Sue will tell you, you see her washing up dishes and you can see her lips moving and no sound coming out. What was she doing? She was praying. She was praying. And Paul says, he says, yes, I pray for you and I pray for the church. So don't think prayer is simply something that you have to go to a prayer meeting to do. You should go to a prayer meeting. You really should. There should be a, 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 at least uh, at some point in, in your week where you gather with other Christians to pray, perhaps part of a Bible study, perhaps a, specifically a prayer meeting. But don't limit your understanding of prayer to that. Pray anywhere, anytime, at any point, you can pick up the royal telephone and you can call home. You can cry out to God. You can do it in the middle of the night. You can do it in a hospital. You can do it in a prison. You can do it on the brink of death. You can do it in the maternity ward. You can do it as you recover from a, an accident or something. Anytime, anywhere, any place. So he prays. And he prays for the two most crucial blessings any church could ever have. 
grace and peace. Can you imagine a church, perhaps you can, where there is no grace and where there is no peace? Why, even the world, even the most ignorant unbeliever who came into this place today would expect that here of all places he would be able to find he may not be able to describe it in the words but he would expect this would be a place a gathering in which there would be grace and peace they go together the church and those things go together in people's minds they go together that's their expectation well it's a right expectation isn't it grace and peace perhaps at some point in your life in the providence of God you may not know why but perhaps at some point in your life you've been in a church and there's been very graceless behaviour and I'm sure it's made an impact upon you and I hope it's made the kind of impact on you that it's made on me which is I never ever want to hear it or see it or be part of it or be near it ever again as long as I live Because it is the thing that is most contradictory, it seems to me, to the gospel and to salvation and to the love of God. So grace and peace. Well, surely this is a place where you find peace. I went to Royal Prince Alfred Hospital for a checkup, And I notice, every time I go, I notice the Roman Catholic Cathedral, right across the road, has its doors wide open. And... People go in there. What do you find when you go in there? What are you looking for when you go in there? Obviously, people who've come from hospital, they're traumatised, they're worried, they're fearful, whatever it might be. People go in there without even understanding it. What do they want to go in? They want a bit of peace. Oh, they want to just sit there. Look at the sun shining through the lead light windows. They want to just bow their head. They just want peace. They want some peace. It's the same when I have this monthly meeting and we meet the same place in the city every time and next door is the uniting, is a uniting church. It has its doors always open. It has a little sign up saying, why don't you come in here and find a bit of peace for a little while? You see, Well, we're not talking about that kind of peace here so much. We're talking about peace, that pervading sense of of spiritual well-being and acceptance. That peace that comes because the thing that troubled you most because of the work of the Holy Spirit was your sin and your disobedience and your life up to this point. And perhaps you look back on your life to this point and think it's a train wreck, spiritually speaking, if I take stock of it. So many things so many things, so many different things have happened, I've done so many things that are are wrong but peace in my soul the peace that comes from knowing that my sins have been washed away by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ so my conscience is at peace, my conscience is quiet it no longer condemns me, not in the sense as it once did So, grace and peace. He wishes them, he prays for them, and my goodness, the church in Corinth needs it. It needs that peace. Because there are mumblings and grumblings. You see, one of the things these false teachers in Corinth have been saying about Paul is, Paul, you promised to visit us, and now you've changed your mind. And so we've gone to the congregation and we've used that and we've said to the congregation, there you go, that's an indication that Paul is not really qualified. He's not really an apostle. You see, He's going to talk about that a bit later on. So they certainly need that peace. Well, that's the introduction to his letter. Important, and it sort of sets the scene. And then from verse 3... To verse 7 he wants you to think uh, about three things let me read verse 3 to verse 7 for you again, we won't have time to 
open up all these three things, but at least we can identify them and think about them. So this is how he's starting his letter. Uh, And he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he gives God a couple of new titles. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. And then he goes on and he tells us this, that this God comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which we ourselves have received and are comforted by God. As the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds from Christ. If we are afflicted, we apostles, but all of us, any of us, if we are afflicted, it's for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Our hope for you is steadfast because we know you are partakers of the sufferings as you are partakers of the sufferings so also you will partake of the consolation. Now, what does all that mean? How can we sort of unravel all that and unpack it and, and, and get to grips with it? Well, think like this. There are three things here to think about. Three things here which he mentions. The first is He wants to say something about the God you think you know. The God you think you know. And then in the second place, he wants to say something about the life, and he's talking about the Christian life, the life you didn't expect. The life you didn't expect. And then thirdly, he has something to say about the fellowship that gets neglected. The fellowship that gets neglected. So there's three ideas which hopefully will give some structure and some understanding to what he wants to say to them. Now first of all, of course, he's God-centred, this man. He's God-centred and he's Christ-centred and so it's not surprising that he begins by a benediction Benediction, you think, usually might come at the end, but doesn't not necessarily coming at the end. It can come any time, and so he begins with essentially what is a benediction. It's uh, an expression of worship and appreciation and love, perhaps. Uh, he says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hang on, I thought God blessed me. Well, God does bless you. But you bless God. There's nothing to stop you blessing God. Your life is meant to bless God. You see? Adorn, glorify, honour, worship and love, etc., etc. So he's saying now, let's together, he's writing to the church, let's say, blessed be the God. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, this is going to be the theme of heaven for all eternity, isn't it? Isn't this exactly, doesn't this exactly sum up ultimately where we're going if we're Christians and what we're going to enjoy when we get there and to some degree what we're going to do when we get there? Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, of course, Paul believes wholeheartedly and absolutely and fundamentally in the Trinity. He believes in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. One in three, and three in one. Three persons, one God, one Godhead. And so, he's always taking opportunities to underline that. Here's another place where he uh, emphasizes the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says, 
Now wait a minute. Have we appreciated this about God? What is our view of God? What is your view of God? Well here, he puts it like this, with two new, different, perhaps you might say unusual titles for God, but here they are nonetheless, they're in the Bible, they're in the words of this, he says, he's the father of mercies, and he's the God of all comfort. That is so beautiful and wonderful. The Father of mercies. What does a father do? Well, a father begets. A father generates, if you like. A father is, in the Bible, spoken of as someone who is responsible for or from whom flows something. And so here... God is designated the Father of mercies. And this is meant to encourage us and meant to comfort us. It's a throwback, isn't it, to that favourite verse from the Old Testament. And we sing about it, don't we, that God's mercies, plural, are new every morning and His faithfulness is great. His mercies. My dear friend, where would you be without the mercy and the mercies of God today? Stop a minute and think about it. Where would you be? Isn't it true to say, and don't you know it, I know it so well, and you know it so well, that the one thing we're constantly in need of is the mercy of God. Not just to become a Christian. Of course, Becoming a Christian, the death of Christ, the life of Christ, the resurrection of Christ. And all of those things, they are the supreme expression and gift of mercy to us. But every day we need mercy and mercies. Every time you go to God to seek forgiveness for something. No doubt you do that on a regular basis. As I do, I'm sure you do if you're a Christian. What are you really asking for? What are you really depending upon? What are you really in need of? Or what you're really, what I'm really in need of and what you're really in need of is mercy. Mercy, pour out your mercy upon me. What is mercy? Well, it's, it's something that's totally undeserved. See? That's what makes it a mercy. It's not something you deserve at all. It's not something you've earned. It's just something which is poured out upon you purely out of the goodness and the kindness of the person who is giving it to you. And this is the father of mercies. Every other little mercy, every other little skerrick of human kindness can be traced back to the image of God in fallen man and from there back to God himself. It's only that that would make any of us remotely merciful at all. And so mercies, the Father of mercies, does that encourage you today? Do you ever think of God like that? Is that a name, a title that you've thought of before? Just dwell on it and let it sink into your mind, into your heart. Use it in a prayer and say, you are the Father of mercies, I need your mercy. You're the Father of mercies. Please give me mercy today. And the God of not just comfort, but the God of all comfort. All comfort. He's talking about spiritual comfort, of course. The God of all comfort. You think he's the God of all justice? He's the God of all judgment? He's the God of all wrath? He's the God of all righteous anger against sin. Yes, he is. He's the God of heaven. He's the God of hell. Yes, he is, absolutely. But he's the God also of all comfort. He's writing to Christians. 
And some of those Christians are very discomforted. And perhaps you today are a very discomforted Christian. Think about that. All sorts of things that disturb us and disturb our spiritual equilibrium and our peace and then things that make us so uncomfortable in mind, in heart, in spirit, whatever it might be. It might be illness, it might be family problems, it might be a hundred things. The last thing you say about them is they're comfortable. You never describe them like that at all. They're very op- the opposite of it. But here, your God, the God that has saved you if you're a Christian today, He's the God of all comfort. All comfort. And He's the one to whom you should go and I should go and we should go when we're discomforted and when we're made uncomfortable. Now, he's talking from a background of where he's going to tell them. He's going to actually write a list for them of the kind of discomforts, physically and spiritually, that he has been through, and quite a lot of them, on their behalf. Because of the Corinthians and other Christians and churches, not unlike the Corinthians at all. He knows very well what it is to be very, very uncomfortable. But he hasn't reneged on his love for God, on his appreciation of God, and on his understanding of God, on the strength of those discomforts. No, he hasn't done that at all. He still regards God as the God of all comfort. The one you can go to if what you're needing and what you're looking for is comfort. Comfort. A sense of comfort and warmth and acceptance and peace and being received and being loved and being nurtured and being waited on hand and foot because that's what God's done with you for much of your life without you realising it. If not, he's done it through his servants, through his angels, through his providence. He's the God of all comfort. And if God had withdrawn his hand from my life or your life, at any single point in your existence on this earth, you would have been terribly uncomfortable. And if God were to withdraw his hand off society, of cultures, of nations, they become terribly uncomfortable places, don't they? You see that on every hand, don't we? So, this is the God we need to remember. This is the God we know. This is the God that Jesus Christ has taken us by the hand. He's dealt with the thing that separated us from God the Father. He's led us by the hand and he's made peace between us and God. He's brought us to God, this God, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Well, may the Lord bless these thoughts to our hearts and take them to heart and think about them during the week and pray them and depend upon them and believe them. They come to you, of course, solely and only and all wrapped up in Jesus Christ. He's going to explain that. You can't have these things without Jesus Christ. That's how they come to you and that's how you come to them. By personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Oh Heavenly Father, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, giver of grace and peace, we bow in your presence because we are your people. We are your church. And Father, we pray that that truth will dawn upon us in a new and wonderful way. And pray, Father, that we will make the use and the most of this amazing relationship, this newfound status, as it were, 
that the Lord Jesus Christ has accomplished for us and brought us into by his death, his life, his resurrection. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.